Hi, everybody. I'm Eric Brynjolfsson. Uh, welcome to the digital, uh, the Stanford Digital Academy. Uh, let me try that again. The Stanford Digital Economy Lab lunch seminar series. Um, we're very uh, fortunate to have with us today Erica Groshen. Uh, she was the commissioner of the Bureau of Labor Statistics of the United States until uh, 2017. And uh, she's now a senior economist at Cornell's uh, uh, ILR. Uh, graduate of Harvard University, has been doing a lot of research on the work that um, of, of how to measure economic data. And today she's going to be talking about modernizing measurement of productivity with non-standard data. Um, we have a, a opportunity to ask questions through the is it, it's the Q and A, right, uh, Christy? Yes, um, we're using the Q and A function within Zoom. So for questions at the end of her talk, um, please do that. It's in your bottom toolbar there. I think though, Eric, we usually, you know, if people want to ask questions throughout, they can add them there and we'll try to get to them um, as, yeah. as we can. So what we'll do is, is if you have a clarification question, just something that wasn't clear on one of the, the slides or what Erica said, feel free to ask the Q and A question there. And then we're going to save about, you know, 10 or 15 minutes at the end for more broader, more general questions as well. So ask them through the Q&A and I'll, uh, I'll moderate those and, and pass them on to Erica. So with that, let me turn it over to you, Erica. Looking forward to uh, your presentation. Well, thank you, Eric. Thank you for, for the invitation to speak to your um, colleagues and, and to this group. Um, it's uh, always great to talk to people who are very involved in um, yeah, all the exciting you know, tech world um, and to get your perspective and also to share with you some of the uh, important thinking that's going on uh, with regard to our national statistics. So this paper uh, will be a chapter in a forthcoming Brookings Institution book about how to measure productivity better. And uh, my two colleagues, Michael Horgan, who's, at the, uh, who's president of the Upjohn Institute for Employment Research and Christopher Kurtz, who's um, at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. And I have, um, were asked to, uh, to kind of summarize um, how our thinking about how non-standard data could improve productivity measures. We're gonna take, it, this is, uh, not a, this is more of a think piece, not a, not a review of the literature. It's not new number crunching, but it's really trying to put a lot of thinking about these issues together in one place so that people can have a, a reasoned discussion about it and, and push forward. So let me, uh, let me start my slides. Um, okay. um, Got it. Yeah. Okay. And then let me. Uh, great. Excellent. Um, okay. So uh, I'm going to start off by uh, asserting uh, some important things uh, that official statistics really are uh, an important part of our national infrastructure, and in the 21st century, uh, uh, you know, a, a really an increasingly important part of our national infrastructure. Uh, they're a public good. That means they're not excludable. You're, uh, it's very hard to people to, uh, to exclude people from knowledge of important statistics, and it's non-rivalrous. Your knowing it does not diminishes any, it does not diminish anyone else's ability to know it. And this is this makes it inherently a government job to produce because um, theory is quite clear on this that, it, that perfect competition will undersupply a public good, and it's quite, it's easy to see that national well-being is improved by government pro, uh, provision because it informs decisions at all levels, policy, but also business and um, and family decisions, etc. And uh, to the point, uh, more to the point uh, is often forgotten in terms of um, uh, private statistics, that private sector statistics are uh, most of the time rely on official statistics in order to, uh, to be interpretable. They're a necessary official, uh, it's, uh, if you have a batch of private statistics, you usually want to validate 
uh, what you're finding by comparison to official statistics. You need sample weights, you need to assess your uh, coverage, and you need to add to it missing information in order to make sense out of it. So it's some of the many ways that official statistics are infrastructure. And productivity is one of the important things that's measured uh, in official statistics. And it's important because it, uh, productivity drives national well-being. That it's how a productivity is this, this measure of how much we make as a, um, overall as a country from, from the inputs that, that are provided, right? And the elements that, uh, that, uh, that support productivity and influence productivity include technological advances, human capital, intangible investment, expanded uses of IT. So this is a, um, a very important way of, uh, of understanding how wealth creation and well-being is created. And when you have this measure, uh, it was Lord Kelvin who said in the 1800s that you cannot manage what you can't measure. So if we want to manage productivity because it leads to well-being, then we need to um, we need to measure it so that we understand its causes and its consequences, distributional impacts. We need it in order to make good fiscal and monetary policy forecasts in order to inform our decisions as well. So productivity is, is a really key concept uh, for doing a lot of policy. Uh, and give you an idea of uh, you know, a current debate right now, um, it's been noticed that in uh, the official estimates up until the late uh, 1970s, Productivity and hourly compensation pretty much grew in lockstep, and that's what you'd expect according to uh, most straightforward neoclassical economics. But starting in the late 1970s, there began to be a divergence, and since then, productivity growth has outpaced uh, hourly compensation growth quite substantially. Uh, and this is, a, this is a chart produced by the Economic Policy Institute uh, people looking at this have, have been alarmed, have been ta talked about what are, why is it that we've had this divergence? Is this part of, you know, this seems to be part of widening inequality in the US where the owners of capital are gaining far more than, the, the, than, than workers who own no capital. Uh, and at the same time, when people look at this, one of the big questions that's been raised is, well, is this real? Or is this just the result of measurement error? Maybe if we were measuring compensation properly or productivity properly, uh, you wouldn't get this divergence. And so uh, getting these measures right really makes a huge amount of difference. So today I wanna talk about what the current state of productivity measurement is, um, a general framework for bringing non-standard uh, data for uh, to productivity measurement, to think about this, then, then go through some promising opportunities and progress that's been made. And then uh, it might seem tangential, but I don't uh, think it is at all, um, argue that ag agency reorganization, statistical agency reorganization may be really important to, pr uh, to improving productivity measurement. And then I'm gonna finish up with policy recommendations which includes a call to action for everybody here too. So let me push ahead. What is the state of a productivity measurement? Well, uh, there are two main measures of productivity growth in this country. One is labor productivity growth, which is how much do we produce per hour worked in the country? And this is a practical matter is measured as the difference between the output growth rate, that's GDP growth rate, minus the labor hours growth rate in the country. And this number is produced by the Bureau of Labor Statistics on a quarterly basis with about a two month lag. And um, output, the GDP measures, come from the BEA and from census. 
And these are deflated by price indexes that are supplied mostly by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And you need to deflate it because you don't want to measure, you don't want to be fooled by inflation um, when you're looking at productivity. It does not make us wealthier when, uh, when our price level goes up. We need to take that out. And then that's, uh, and the labor hour measures comes from the, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Multi-factor productivity is a, a different way of thinking about productivity. And this takes account of not just labor input, but the combined input of labor and capital. So if you have more capital, it makes people more productive. So uh, the idea is, well, per unit of, of this combined wealth of the country in terms of labor and capital, how much have we produced? And so that is measured uh, through uh, the ratio of a quantity index of output divided by a quantity index of combined labor and capital input. And this is produced uh, by BLS annually, not quarterly, and there's a three month lag on producing that. And you can see uh, where the various uh, data inputs from that come from. Um, so I hope this gives you the sense that, that measuring productivity is actually fairly challenging because in order to do it, you have to combine data from different sources, from BLS, from BEA, from uh, census, and not all of these data sources are fully com compatible. They uh, may, uh, some of them may be measured on different time periods. They uh, may have different industry definitions, things like that. Uh, so the, so uh, people at, uh, uh, BEA in, in order to just put together GDP deals with a lot of that. And then when they give the GDP to BLS, BLS has to work with the data to, to make them more compatible. Uh, uh, Brett Moulton has written uh, a really uh, excellent paper discussing all of the challenges and efforts to, produce, uh, to improve measurement of productivity. And there have been many improvements to it, but in, you know, it's rather ironic. The more improvements that are made to, ma uh, to measuring productivity, the more people hunger for it to be measured even better. Right? Um, now, service areas are particularly challenging for measuring productivity because the output is, is hard to measure. That's the main thing. Um, for, you know, think about uh, legal services. How do you measure a unit of legal services? Well, it's typically, well, you know, how many, uh, how, uh, how, do build, how do law offices build? It's by number of hours of, uh, of attorneys time. Right, but that's that's measuring input uh, using input measures to measure output. Right, so service uh, services are particularly challenging, and the and the adjustments, the way that you want to think about it, varies a lot from one service to the next. In addition to being challenging, this is this is a growing part of the economy, so that poses uh, poses difficulties. Um, many of these difference, many of these challenges give, uh, produce year-to-year -year noise in productivity measurement. And that's one of the reasons why the people who study productivity very often, uh, in fact, pretty much all the time, do not get hung up on year-to-year -year changes in productivity. They take averages over broad periods of time to research trends with the idea that the, uh, the measurement challenges lead to volatility that are uh, that that uh, will offset over longer periods of time. So, a lot of pro progress has been made, but much more needs to be done. Let me give you an idea of what this looks like. Uh, here's a chart that goes um, all the way back to the beginning of productivity measurements, 1959. That was the first year that that it was produced, actually through 2019. And the black bar is, uh, is, annual, um, is the annual productivity growth, all right? And the, behind that are the, these aqua bar, uh, the black lines is, is the, annual, the annual estimate, are the green bars. And these green bars 
uh, typically are averaged over periods of time just to, to represent different regimes of productivity growth. And that's really been what most of the people have studied when they've studied productivity growth because of this high volatility in, uh, in productivity uh, measurement. And obviously we'd all like to see a, uh, a measure where the annual averages were, were likely to be more, um, annual measures were likely to be more meaningful. These annual measures come from subtracting these two lines from each other. The output growth line, which is in black, um, and then taking that and subtracting hours growth from it, which is in blue. And you see both of those lines have a lot of volatility in them as well. So, um, so what are the incentives for using non-standard data in putting together these official statistics? Let me start off by defining what I mean by non-standard data. Um, usually what we're talking about are, are data that are derived from some source other than a survey, a government survey. These are usually what some, uh, some people call organic records. They are produced as a byproduct of some activity. Um, so they can be government or private administrative data, corporate records, transactional files, web scraped, private, private sector aggregation, something like that. So it's all of the, the big data um, world plus, plus others. And it's not that statistical agencies haven't tapped into some of these things before, but uh, they usually relied primarily on, uh, on surveys because they have, uh, because surveys had some key advantages for the statistical agencies. They have known statistical properties because uh, the agent, the statistical agency can choose the sample. And they also answer questions that are designed precisely to meet measurement objectives. So there, there, uh, there has been a real preference for the use of surveys, but surveys are expensive and they're subject to declining response rates. So uh, the reason that statistical agencies are increasingly reaching beyond their surveys is so that they can improve the quality of the statistics by adding granularity, coverage, timeliness, precisions, or, or accuracy. And also so that they can counteract the falling response rates and not impose more burden on, uh, on the populace by doing so. The other goal, of course, is to raise efficiency and resilience so sometimes it is uh, less expensive and gives them a, a, an alternative source of some information so that they can be sure that their answer is correct. All right, so agencies are looking at, uh, at more and more of these, uh, using more and more non-standard data, but it's not, uh, the solutions are not quite as easy as you might think. There's some very uh, important general challenges for stats agencies to use non and my four years at BLS taught me a lot about these, about these problems. Um, so I wanna go through them with you, not because they're insurmountable, uh, they can all be managed, but it, it clarifies that there really is um, an important, you know, there's some important considerations here. All right, so first of all, not all data is, uh, is of, of equal quality, right? So some, some data that you could get might not actually have very much coverage or might not cover sectors that you care about. Um, and so you need to understand what the coverage is and be sure that it actually, uh, that it actually helps you, right? Uh, you need to understand what, the, what selection biases there might be, who is reporting or not, because in all of these private sector data, uh, you, you do not have the entire country, all industries, all kinds of people, whatever. It's going to be some subset 
of those that, that are engaging in whatever activity it is. You may have a lot of records, but you're almost certainly excluding the people who aren't engaged in whatever program or transaction you're talking about. Uh, the data, uh, uh, how, how well is it curated to make sure that it's not missing uh, information, that there are no errors, and then what kind of a history do you have on it so that you could actually incorporate it. There are issues of access. Does the statistical agency have access? What are the costs to dealing with it both in, uh, in advance and uh, in terms of oversight of the producer of the data, there can be legal and administrative restrictions, there can be continuity risks that you're not sure you're going to be able to have uh, continued access to it. If you don't have continued access to it, then it may not be suitable. Uh, you don't want to build a process around a data source that's going to disappear. Uh, you need to understand whether or not the respondents and participants in this activity are, are protected from being having their identity revealed and whether or not their uh, informed consent is needed. Um, so what are the privacy implications and what are the disclosure controls that, that you need in place? And then there are a lot of operational questions. Um, uh, do, you, do the agencies have the computer storage, the computational capacity to deal with it, the, the computation and analytical capacity in terms of human capital and software, uh, what kind of linkages are needed, and is there, and are you going to get it in time to be able to enter into, to, to actually be used in the production process? Because it's not very useful if it comes in way too late. Uh, and then there, there's, there's the comparability as you merge different strategies and data sources. Uh, do you have, uh, do you need quarterly information? Uh, do you need it? Uh, is annual good enough? Or, or do you have the sectors well represented? Or do you uh, are some of them missing? Or can you, uh, can you identify which sectors are represented? And then uh, the last one I'll mention is, is mission compatibility. Uh, it's very, that may seem kind of vague, but the important thing here is that, that uh, statistical agencies produce data that has a lot of, uh, uh, that has a lot of salience for the financial community in particular. So you would not want to have your statistical agency dependent on data that could be manipulated by a data provider, or that could be front run by them in order to make a profit because they knew what was coming out. Um, and you also need to ensure that you won't have the statistical agency become dependent on a particular kind of data and then have the provider threaten to withdraw it if the, if, if prices aren't, um, uh, if, if the agency doesn't pay a much higher price than in the past, or just uh, they just decide not to produce it anymore and all of a sudden the statistical agency is left high and dry with no alternative source. So um, those, are, all those can all be managed, but it's, uh, it does mean that any, when you're thinking of any source, you have to think hard about whether or not it really is going to be uh, uh, a plus. Now, having mentioned all of those, let's think about uh, what kind of framework, um, uh, you know, let's think specifically about productivity measurement and how it is you would incorporate some of, of these non-standard data into productivity measurement. Well, the easiest case, of course, is when you find a new source for survey equivalent data. So the agency has already been producing, um, the statistical agency has been producing a certain kind of data already, and all of a sudden a new source pops up that produces uh, essentially the same number. Well, that's, that's the ideal, right? Then you just slot in that new source, uh, you monitor it for all other problems and you, you use it. Otherwise though, and, and mo most of the time, the new data source is not exactly the same. And that means that you have to change your measurement strategy to adapt to this new kind of information. 
And that means you have to weigh things like, well, is this beneficial? You know, uh, yes, it's different from what, what we had before, but is it, is it better? Right? And if it's not, how much worse is it? Okay. The second question is, is the methodology used to, to prepare to, uh, to produce this sufficiently transparent? Because statistical agencies have a, um, an obligation to use transparent methodologies so that uh, the users of the data fully understand the virtues and the limitations of any of their measures. So uh, is the methodology used to produce the input data sufficiently transparent? And then will the changes that the statistical agency has to use to adopt, uh, to adapt to it going to result in a transparent methodology or one that's going to be full of a lot of judgmental factors that, uh, that are harder to, to be transparent about. Is it, or is it going to entail a break in series? Is the agency going to have to say, okay, we have a new better measure, uh, but that's, it's not the same as what we had before. Uh, statistical agencies don't like to do that very much because that's very painful for users. Uh, will it require changes in other series for consistency? Are the aggregations acceptable? So all of these things weigh in, and that means that not all, uh, even if you pass the other barriers when you're looking at productivity in particular, because it's such a complex concept, the, that these, these things can be barriers as well. That said, uh, there actually are a lot of promising opportunities and progress, but this is why my list, uh, I have a list of, of them here and I'm gonna go through the, some of them quite quickly because I don't wanna uh, run out of time entirely. Uh, but we, uh, I have a set of, I don't know, nine or 10 cases here, just give you an idea of what's going on. Uh, and, so, uh, so let me run through some of them to give you an idea. Um, so there's been a very, there's been some interesting work done by, uh, by Bern, Fernald and Reinsdorf on the productivity slowdown. And they have assembled quite a, a, a wide array of new data sources to look at particular uh, causes and measurement issues of the recent productivity slowdown. And so their, their paper is a good example of how you can tap into other sources to try and delve into uh, what could be causing the recent decline in productivity. And they, um, and uh, one of the things that's, um, that's interesting about this is that it does, you know, they do suggest that, uh, that there are, that that, uh, pro, that mismeasurement may be part of what's going on here, okay, uh, in the recent slowdown in productivity growth. Um, the, uh, there's been a National Bureau of Economic Research and Census uh, um, Economic Studies productivity database that's worked, that has produced detailed industry information on labor productivity and multi-factor productivity. So that's an example of bringing other data to bear on the productivity series to be able to disaggregate it. And many, uh, a lot of research has been done, increasing number amounts of research has been done using that to, um, to understand uh, productivity changes better. Um, disaggregated productivity, uh, this is a really interesting project by BLS and the Census together, and they are trying to build up industry productivity measures from, from plant level data, looking at the dispersion of, of productivity within industries by plants to understand the implications for official statistics. And they, um, they conclude that uh, measurement is an, important issue, uh, is an important issue for productivity, uh, for understanding you know, fluctuations in productivity. Uh, some other different kinds of examples. 
The Board of Governors is leveraging uh, a different survey, their survey of, uh, of plant capacity, which is a Federal Reserve survey, to impute product, uh, productivity before the census data comes out. So they are trying to uh, speed up the production of productivity estimates by using this, this other survey. And they're doing uh, something like that also uh, with a utilization adjusted multi-factor productivity. So the first one is, is a, a labor-based one and this one is for multi-factor productivity. Uh, the medical records is, is uh, work is focusing on one of the biggest service sectors, a growing service sector where productivity measures are problematic because it's harder for the statistical agencies when the method to, you, to produce a particular output changes dramatically, such as uh, treating depression, uh, switching from being treated mostly for, by talk therapy to using pharmaceuticals. Right now, the way we measure productivity uh, says that uh, we measure the product, essentially we measure the productivity of talk therapy and we measure the productivity of uh, a pharmaceutical therapy without, but we don't measure productivity benefit of switching from one to the other. And pharmaceutical therapy is much less expensive um, than talk therapy for example. So both BLS and BEA are, uh, have come up with experimental disease-based price indexes using alternative data sources um, um, of various kinds. And the idea is to say, okay, let's have a single price index for treating depression and see what uh, that, that will take into account, to, into account the switch of treatment from one method to the other. And so, uh, and so they've been using uh, administrative data for that purpose. And that's, um, uh, I encourage you, if you're interested to take a look at them, the BLS and BEA have two different uh, measures. They have different virtues and limitations. Both of them though, do not have a, uh, they can't quite close the circle because they don't have a quality measure in that yet, but they're working toward it and, um, and it's very promising. Two other things that I want to measure before I uh, mention before I go on um, is that there is increasing interest um, in tapping into unemployment insurance system wage records. Right now, the statistical system does not have access on an ongoing basis to UI system wage records. That is a glaring omission in our, uh, in our uh, statistical system, I would say. Um, these could be used to augment or replace a number of surveys that uh, the BLS in particular does. And this would enhance granularity, timeliness, accuracy, frequency, and add more information. To, to what the, uh, the statistical agencies have. There are all sorts of sensitive ownership uh, reasons uh, as to why uh, BLS doesn't have access to it, but uh, there are reasons to think this could change. There's a project by the Chamber of Commerce, Lumina Foundations to, um, to create more uniform records and to increase access to them. And uh, this could ideally be built into infrastructure uh, or UI system bills that are coming up. And if so, this would be a real game changer in, uh, in our data uh, in productivity measurement because we'd have much better uh, measures of hours and labor inputs. Uh, and another vein, credit card data is uh, also a, a area very ripe for improvements uh, to productivity measures. And uh, BEA is working on improving retail spending measures using this information. And there are 
there are also uh, experiments to see if we can use just information, say from an Amazon type company or from credit card information so that we could get the P's and the Q's from the same data source. Okay, so uh, now I want to uh, then talk a little bit about how agency reorganization could improve productivity measurement. So there are these opportunities out there, but one of the challenges to pushing forward on them is, uh, is that the BEA, BLS, and Census are separate agencies and don't have a single a statistical agency umbrella under which they operate. And we argue that reorganization could advance the successful use of non-standard data. This, is, this has not been proposed before. Uh, Janet Norwood, a former BLS commissioner, wrote a book about this. Both the Obama and Trump administrations have proposed this, and previous other administrations have proposed it. It still hasn't happened, but let's talk about why it would be a good idea. Um, the agencies could then pool some resources that they now provide separately, both in scale and scope. And it would also lower the barriers to sharing data among statistical agencies because uh, it's harder to, uh, to share data between departments than it is to share data within larger departments the, uh, the, uh, because you have restrictions that come into play between uh, between large departments. Now, um, now if this is a good idea, um, this data sharing and reducing these barriers would be such a good idea, you might ask, well, well why haven't we done it? And uh, uh, first of all is that, of course, if you just combine the agencies without doing it well, then all you've done is co-locate them with little impact on their products or um, at, you know, at a cost, right? So, so first of all, you've got to do it right. But assuming you could do it right, um, there, are, uh, there are some barriers. First of all, usually in government, you have inertia unless there's a crisis. So um, there's a sense in which maybe we haven't had enough, a big enough crisis yet. Um, there, are there, of course, would be costs to, recon to reconfigure the administrative structures. Uh, you also have some uh, some parts of um, of you know of our government that would lose influence. So certain appropriators would have uh, would lose uh, agency. They, some uh, uh, some of them would lose some agencies, and others would gain. And the departments, so the the Department of Labor. Um, would lose the BLS and the way we think this should be done, uh, the Commerce Department should lose census and the BEA. Well, those are all, those are large agencies. BLS, BEA, and census are are fairly large, uh, particularly census and and, B, and uh, BLS are very large in their departments. And so, uh, no Secretary of Labor or Commerce probably really wants to give up that much of their turf. Uh, staff may be resistant and reluctant to do this sort of thing. Uh, you, the users of data may worry about dilution of the mission and contact uh, with and having contact. Oh, uh, they would worry that their agency would become some part of a larger monolith that, uh, that so they would lose contact or that their, their, their particular programs that they care about would no longer have priority. And there are risks of putting most of the statistical system under one roof. There have been, uh, there have been experiences in Canada when some appropriators didn't like something that one part of the statistical system was doing, they defunded the all of Stats Canada. Um, and plus, if you put all the eggs under one basket and you get poor leadership or a politically motivated leadership, you could have a, uh, you could have disruptions to the entire statistical system. So, so there are reasons to worry. 
And that's why we feel that there's some very important prerequisites for a successful stats USA. You would want to have statistical independence um, for the uh, for the agencies for BLS, um, uh, well, for the Stats USA as a whole, and for all of the agencies within that whole Stats USA, and you'd want to continue the the essence of the Asian agency missions. You wouldn't want this to be a way to water down those missions. Uh, you. Uh, there's almost no reason to do it if you don't provide strong data sharing capacity and synchronization of data amongst the agencies. This is the main, you know, a main reason to do it. If you're not going to do that, why bother? Uh, you would also want coordinated strategic planning for data collection and dissemination, for negotiation with the private sector, for joint projects, and for data governance so that you get the real benefits of this, so that you have the agencies talking together and having a joint approach to gathering and managing their data assets. You would want them to agree on, on measurement and statistical methods. So yes, they already use the same mix codes and occupation codes, but they may use different aggregation schemes. And they, they may assign codes a little bit differently. And this, this is an ongoing problem for the BEA and for anybody who tries to combine data from BLS and census in particular. You'd want a common infrastructure for information technology, training, and data access. Why is this important? Well, right now, the statistical agencies are more and more being forced to share these services with non-statistical agencies in their current home departments. And that, risks their statistical independence because then their home departments have, um, have more levers to exercise control over them. So if you want to achieve uh, economies of scale in this infrastructure, have it done between statistical agencies, not with non-statistical agencies. And then you also need adequate and flexible funding for all of the quality improvements and the efficiency gains that we're talking about, you don't, you would not want a, a Stats USA to be a, a route towards just defunding the agencies. So suppose we did that, what is it that we could get in 20 years? Well, I believe, uh, and my co-authors and I believe that in 20 years, we could get to the point where research establishes the best measures of service sector productivity. Um, and that with short lags, we could get monthly, maybe even weekly labor and multi-factor productivity growth. And these could be disaggregated by industry, by state and sub-state areas. That, and they'd be com comparable across industries and regions. And they would add up to the national numbers, which they don't now. Uh, the input components, should be available at the same levels of disaggregation as the published statistics so that people can delve further into why, um, why you're seeing various kinds of fluctuations. And you'd be in a world where less dramatic revisions would be needed. This is where we could go. So how do we get there? Well, it's using a Stats USA idea to give us robust access to streams of high quality data. You need adequate resources and mechanisms, the ones I talked about, to coordinate. And you need this independence from political interference. So this leads us to a set of policy recommendations. Um, uh, first of all, the public sector uh, should continue to produce productivity and other official statistics. We do not believe that it makes sense for uh, any for uh, this to be a private sector uh, product. The, the three agencies should uh, should though operate within a Stats USA that follows the prerequisites that I mentioned above. The agencies should be funded better. Their funded their funding has uh, been cut of late. They should be funded better and they should have flexibility and multi-year money so that they can engage in long-term investments. They should establish consistent privacy protection and informed consent um, uh, roles. This is important because now they're inconsistent. And then there are two steps to improving the input data that are very important. Uh, 
they need to improve private sector data quality and their access to them. And there are at least two parts of this, the private sector creating a facility so that large firms can provide data for federal statistics safely um, with either a mandate or an incentive for them to participate, right? And also the agencies should be encouraging the development of interoperable common schema that would feed into a facility like this. Public sector data, administrative data also needs to be improved and the access to it. There was a commission on evidence-based policy making that had its very uh, important proposals, those should be enacted. And we need to go beyond what that commission recommended to, um, to expand this to particular federal, uh, some of the federal data like the IRS data and to federally funded state program data, which in particularly includes the UI wage records that I talked about before. So to sum up, um, what's the outlook for productivity measure? Well, there has been a lot of pro progress, more than many people think, but less than is possible. The future really does is bright with opportunities. Not all of these are gonna pay off, but the bar barriers to progress can be managed. And so uh, we do believe that there are many opportunities ahead. And these improved statistics will benefit policy, will ben benefit businesses and households, both by giving us better productivity measures, but also by giving us other, other statistics th uh, that will be better as well. So it's not gonna benefit just productivity measurement. Very quickly by talking about what it is that you can do. You may think that you have no role in this, but actually you do. Uh, first of all, um, I think it's always good to be on the lookout for political interference. And so if you see it, you, you should be watching for it. You should, be, uh, you should certainly look for it and you should decry it if you see it. Secondly, you should engage with critical topics like productivity measure, whatever you do, uh, certainly if you're a researcher, but also uh, if you have uh, important data that could be used for enhancing productivity measure, uh, you, should, uh, you should work on trying to, to, to get that incorporated because it's a public service that is very important. So that means you need to learn. And if you're a teacher, teach about official statistics and you, your students, your colleagues should be uh, participating in the discussion about how to improve the statistics. You can get a job with the statistical agency. You can collaborate with the researchers in, in the statistical agencies, uh, you, your students, et cetera. And then finally, don't free ride. Everybody, if, if you think that official statistics are important, our elected officials need to know that. And so do the people that you interact with on a regular basis. You need to attest to the trustworthiness of the statistics. If you use the data, you need to cite those sources so that people understand how important they are. If you think they're important enough to use, you need to tell people about that. You need to participate in the federal surveys that underlie this information. Otherwise, the data won't be as good as it should be. And you need to encourage others to do so the companies you work for, the, your friends and family at the, at the barbecues, right? And then you can support funding and reorganization. You can join the, the groups that support the statistical agencies like the Friends of BLS and the Census Project. And I give you some links there. So with all this, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to talk to you and your kind attention. My co-authors are listening in. So they they're a, they're uh, hopefully will be able to uh, uh, join us in answering questions. Uh, in um, hey, well, well, thank you so much, Erica. That was terrific, and indeed, uh, uh, Mike Horgan has been uh, answered. We've gotten about a dozen questions, over a dozen questions, and, and Mike has already uh, taken a shot at answering about half of them uh, through the Q and A. Um, and so, thank you, Mike, and I, I gather Christopher's here as well. Um, so let me start by uh, asking questions, a, a variant of what uh, Sebastian Stefan asked uh, online, but linking to the private sector data sources. Uh, tell me a little bit more about what are the barriers to doing that more? Is it that the 
Is it the cost that, you know, this is expensive for them to provide the data and, and make it available or, or, or integrate it? Is it, is it liability? Is it that they're afraid of giving away secrets to their, that their competitors or others might get a hold of? What are some of the things that um, currently are, are barriers to having even more wide use of, of some of those types of data? Uh, so you're talking about the barriers on the company side in uh, contributing to so the why, why is it happening more when you like you know why doesn't mm -hmm. uh, why why aren't we using a lot more private data? There's a lot of point of sale data. There's a lot of uh, employment data that mm -hmm. private companies are collecting pay, uh, payroll data. Sometimes they even come out with uh, alternative uh, statistics about predicting what unemployment is going to be before the government does. Um, so they have relevant data and i know mm -hmm. some of it's being integrated but but when you when you connect with them what are what are some of the things we could do to make it more likely that they would contribute i mean could, is it as simple as writing a check to them or are there other barriers mm. yeah uh so uh, i this is uh, this is my list um generally of, of the barriers that uh often the data you know you know that they're just they're not clean enough, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then, and then there are the access issues. Uh, so sometimes, uh, you know, it's not timely enough. Um, it um, it can also, uh, you know, it's, it's, every one of these. I mean, these things are these. Each of these issues is is here for a reason because there has been a, a, you know, an example in my four years at BLS. I saw it right. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so there was a case where uh, there was a um, the uh, one there was a company that was uh, that was selling uh, airline price information to the BLS, and it was affordable in the BLS. Uh, ran a, had a whole, uh, you know, system using those data. And then some uh, new person came into the, that company and said, well, we should be charging a lot more to BLS for this information, right? And so they, uh, I think that the, the, the price they wanted to charge went up by a factor of 10, but BLS bought it one more year and then and, and then went to some, you know, went back to collecting the data manually because it was cheaper. Mm -hmm. uh, another example like that was uh, BLS did some experimentation with uh, with with some uh, some grocery uh, store prices mm -hmm. and the way BLS needed the data, the timeliness and the granularity of it meant that the company would have to redesign its whole data collection system. And they said, fine, but you're gonna to have to pay for that. And it was much cheaper for BLS to continue to do what it was doing than to pay for a redesign of that company's you know, data collection system. Um, and those, yeah. Mike. Eric, I have one other quick example. We, uh, mm -hmm. When I was at BLS, we had a company that kicked us out of their stores but they also had a chief economist who was very sympathetic to our data needs. So he offered to give us as much electronic data as possible, um, but it wasn't the same kind of match model repricing structure that we needed for CPI. So we ended up having to develop a estimation methodology that was based on average cost pricing and prove to ourselves that this was acceptable for inclusion in the index. Mm -hmm. um, that took a while just to you know, make sure that we had sort of proof of concept but the alternative that they gave us was uh, access to an enormous amount of data. So I think when these opportunities come up, um, taking advantage of them could provide a universe of data that we could never afford with a pure budgeted sample. Right. Uh, one of the other questions had to do with the, um, the randomization. And one of the nice things you can do when, when, when the government controls this is you can try to get a statistically representative sample, but often uh, data from uh, uh, and private organizations is not designed to be and, and isn't particularly random. Um, are you working with any of the companies to, to sort of uh, coordinate and do something cooperative instead of just having their data or, or your data working to, to try to get the best of both worlds perhaps by doing some randomization within their data or, or other things to, to, to fill it out in a, in a uh, partnership? So there have been a lot of uh, clever ideas on that. I and mean, sometimes uh, it may not be random, but it may still have much more information about some sector that 
uh, that the BLS would like more information on. And so there have been times, I think there's been some use of that. I think to date, uh, the most common use when that comes up is just validation. So, okay, here's another way of making sure that we are, you know, BLS says, uh, make sure that they're getting everything they should and that the, that the, the sample that they are choosing is, is, um, uh, is uh, showing the same properties as what they would see in some other, from some other source. Mm -hmm. Erica, Erica there, there, yeah. the, one other approach that we took in CPI is sometimes mm -hmm. you, have, you, you have to have an appetite for bias. Mm -hmm. So that if you have survey control totals that are, that are unbiased, efficient estimators, then can the alternative data, which may be biased, can you use it to ratio allocate down to levels of detail below the higher quality upper level estimates? Mm -hmm. So in that way, you might be, your judgment might be, the mean squared error is small enough to be a sufficient statistic, even though it does have some bias in the estimate. And we did that with ratio allocating um, gasoline expenditures because mm -hmm. we didn't have we didn't have regular mid or premium, so mm -hmm. we used uh, Energy Information Agency data to do that, and yep. that reflects sales to businesses and consumers. Mm -hmm. So you get the the ratios from the government data, but then the more fine grained um, dive in on a particular category from some of the yeah, exactly. The, uh, you get the controlled totals from the survey, and yeah. kind of like the question of how would you actually design a survey if you're going to incorporate big data from the very beginning? Yeah. And I think that's a really nice way of thinking about it. Yeah. And one of the things that the data can sometimes give you is uh, even if it's not very timely, if it's a lot of detail, then you can use it to model disaggregations that you're really interested in. Right. right. And, and that statistical agencies are doing more and more of that. Right. So, uh, as a, uh, one of the questioners, Yupan Wang asks about the um, maintaining the confidentiality of the response, the privacy of the data sources. So um, that's something I know as a special uh, spe special foreign uh, status at uh, the Census Bureau. I know that we have to be very careful about doing that. Um, it, do you have procedures in place when you work with private companies to use the data, but also protect uh, the, the confidentiality of the data sources? Yeah, and I mean, that's of, um, of increasing, yeah, it's, uh, it's more and more difficult as more data becomes available online for people to, <laughs> to use to try and break down confidentiality. It's much harder actually to protect uh, companies' confidentiality than it is to protect individual people's confidentiality. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, I'd say that the, the uh, that there's there's been less work on how to do that right now. The way primarily this is done uh, is through suppression of cells. You know, uh, just suppressing suppressing mm -hmm. disaggregations. Right. So you uh, can't back up. Um, we just have a couple of minutes left. Let me try and get in a couple more quick questions. So uh, Pete Cleanout asks: um, Are mandated reporting requirements necessary to make sure? that private data is provided in a consistent fashion over time. <laughs> when BLS was started, the commissioner said, I we never want to mandate reporting because we need to, uh, uh, we don't want people to, basically we don't want people to hate us. You know, if we make it too easy. <laughs> and so BLS, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, the Census Bureau has, has mandates. BLS, by and large, doesn't, uh, with some exceptions in particular states. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I think incentivizing is probably a good idea. Uh, you could have positive uh, incentives. You could give them rewards, right? That's right. That's right. There, you, could, you could make the argument for certain tax breaks of some sort if, uh, if, if companies provided information easily. That would, that would save... Um, that would save the statistical agencies money. And right. so I, I think there's an argument for that. Yeah. One, one quick caveat, we noticed a race to legal, that there are a lot mm -hmm. of states that say, please, please make the OES mandatory because otherwise companies will not answer the questions ever. Mm -hmm. And so states were actually begging us to make OES um, mandatory if we could in every state. Okay. 
Um, so we're just about out of time. Well, let me just leave you uh, with a question, which is an op opportunity. Uh, Mike Jado asks, are there any resources available to help educators teach about federal statistical agencies? And you, can you remind us also other ways we can learn about what you're doing? If, if you're able to share your slides, Erica, they were terrific. We'd love to make them available. And, uh, and tell us any other pointers. I, I do follow Friends of BLS on Twitter, but uh, um, how else can people learn more? Okay, so uh, uh, two things. First of all, whatever federal statistic you use, call up the people who produce it and learn about it that way. <laughs> you know, it's they are humans on the other side that are producing the data and you should get to know them. Uh, they, you will learn a lot by asking them. So, so the first thing is develop a relationship with your data providers. Um, and, and there are, re in terms of teaching about the statistical agencies, all, all of them have some educational material available. And the American Statistical Association has a lot of material available for teaching statistics and about the statistical agencies. So I would certainly recommend those. Uh, it's, um, it's amazing how, how important it is for, uh, to learn that. I know that the, uh, the people, the students who worked as research assistants at the Federal Reserve Banks and at various government agencies uh, learned so much about federal statistics uh, that really helped them in graduate school when they went to econ or other graduate schools afterwards. So that's another way to learn about it. It's go to an agency that, um, you know, work after college for a year or two for, for some group that analyzes federal statistics and you'll learn a lot. <laughs> well, thank you. Just a quick comment. Go ahead, go ahead Mike, real quick. Uh, the Economic Measurement Seminar is sponsored by NABE in the oh, summer yes. for, for students, for uh -huh. usually- the Association of Business Economists, yeah. great. They cover the entire federal statistical system. Great. Well, well thank, thank you. you, Mike, and thank you, Erica. That was a terrific uh, presentation. We uh, learned quite a lot, and we'll be we'll be following up. Uh, I'm grateful for you ha having you join us. And uh, let me just tell everybody that our next seminar is going to be on April 5th. Uh, Xavier Gabay is going to be talking about power laws in economics and finance, and uh, how digitalization is is changing that. So, I uh, see you in two weeks, April 5th, for Xavier Gabex. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, everyone.